Hey guys, Chris Fix here. At the end of this winch cable is a car I just got for $500. It doesn't run, it doesn't drive. And today I'm gonna show you guys how to fix it up so we could get it running and driving at home with common hand tools on a budget. So we'll spend less than $1,000 to get a really nice running and driving car. You guys are always asking me, Chris, what's a good first car? Something that's safe, something that's large. What's a good around town car that could carry stuff or an inexpensive family car? Well, this car hits on all of that and I paid $500 for it. So let's check it out. Now this is a clean title 2005 Chevy Trailblazer LT and while the title is clean, this car is a mess. This is so dirty. The outside has faded paint. It's all oxidized. But don't worry, I did check right here. Check this out. I compounded and polished right in this little square here and that paint looks awesome, especially compared to this old faded paint. So the outside, we will be able to clean up and make look really good. Now how about the inside? Well, as you can see, the inside isn't very clean either. We're gonna have to do a lot of work to get it clean. Also, we're missing a couple of trim pieces. There should be a trim piece right around the handle here and also around that handle on that side. And finally, this center console, well, it doesn't latch. All things that we could easily fix, so I'm not too concerned, because this is a very well optioned car. We have heated seats in the front, we have a sunroof, all the leather, all the interior pieces are in good condition otherwise, so we'll be able to clean this up really nicely. But I'm not concerned with how clean the interior is or how clean the exterior is. What I'm concerned about is getting this car running. When I was at the owner's house, I couldn't get it started. I couldn't even get it to turn over because this battery was so dead. I tried attaching jumper cables to it, a charger, everything, but it's just so dead, there wasn't even a click from the starter. But with that said, I did make sure to check some of the car's vitals. For example, I checked the oil, wanted to make sure it was in good condition, there was no froth, which could indicate a head gasket leak, and also that it was all the way filled up, and it was, so that was good. I also checked the transmission fluid, wanted to make sure it was filled, and that it was somewhat pink, which it was, so that was also good. And finally, make sure the coolant was topped off, it wasn't rusty, it was the correct dex cool that should be in here, so that was good as well. So the engine oil, transmission fluid, and coolant all look normal. There's nothing that stands out that looks bad, like a head gasket leak or something. But that doesn't mean our engine is good. It could still have low compression. It could still have other issues that would make it junk and not worth to fix. And we don't know because we can't even get it to turn over. Now, I use that to my advantage when negotiating with the owner. And I also found a couple of other things that I want to show you guys. Now, underneath the car, the first thing I noticed was this exhaust system, this muffler. Well, it's shot. And then if we come and look up over by the fuel tank, check this out. There's like melted plastic or something. This looks like this should be an emission hose, like a uh, evap hose or something. Plus back here, it looks like the gas tank is like melted or deformed or something right there. So there's a lot more here that's wrong than a fuel pump. And after inspecting the entire SUV, the owner says he wants $1,000 for it and it just needs a fuel pump, and I disagree. I saw it needed a battery, needed an exhaust, needed something with the EVAP system in the rear, maybe a new gas tank, needs a bunch of interior bits and pieces, a good cleaning, and a lot of little odds and ends here and there. So for me, it was worth $500. That's the offer I made him. He tried to go $750, then he came down to $650, then he said $550, but I held out and I said, listen, $500, cash, I'll tow it today. And that's what we agreed upon. So you always want to hold firm at whatever price you think the car is worth. Don't go above that. And here's why I chose $500. So let's just say worst case scenario, we can't get the car running. So all you need to do is go to Google and search junk car removal and click one of the links that come up. This was the first one that came up. They offered me $410 for this car and they tow it away. That's not even a name your price. That's their first offer. If I wanted to, I could probably put 500 and get all 500 back. Worst case scenario though, I could get $410 and they'll tow the car away. And they could do that because cars like this have value in the catalytic converters, the parts to it. So junkyards part them out and recycle them. So worst case scenario, I lose $90. That's the risk, but the reward is a lot greater. Check this out. This car in good condition is worth $4,000 at a dealer and $3,000 private party. So that means if we could fix this up, we could sell it for $3,000, giving us a profit of $2,000, which is an awesome upside. So if you want to fix the car up and flip it, you'll make yourself about $2,000. But if you want to fix it up and keep it, you'll save yourself about two to $3,000. Either way, it's a lot of fun. Let's see if we could get this car started. And to do that, here are all the tools that you're gonna need. Let's check it out. 
And as usual, we're using common hand tools, stuff that you could get at your local hardware store that won't break the bank. So we have a 150 piece socket set. We have some screwdrivers, breaker bar, a saw, a hammer, torque wrench. We have a pliers and we can't forget about our safety glasses. So let's put these on now. Now you've probably noticed all of these tools here are Craftsman tools and the reason why is because Craftsman reached out to me and they said they wanted a partner in a video with me and they said they'll give me whatever tools I need. They could give me three giant toolboxes loaded with tools but instead I said, why not? I want to show that we could get this car running with a simple tool set. Something like this 150 piece set and a, you know, a couple miscellaneous hand tools and that's the goal. The whole point is we could do this at home without breaking the bank. So let's get this car started. Now the first thing we need to do is remove the old dead battery. So remove the cables from the battery and out with the old and in with the new. Then tighten up each of the battery cables so they're snug and have a good connection. And it's important that we secure the battery. So tighten down the battery hold down and now our battery is safe and won't be a projectile if there is an accident. So with the new battery in, let's go see if we could start her up. All right, so the previous owner said it won't run because it has a bad fuel pump. We're about to test that out right now. We're gonna put the key in the ignition and turn it to the run position. I wanna listen for a fuel pump hum behind me. Ah, I don't hear anything. So the fuel pump isn't running, which is expected, that's what he said. Let's go try to start it anyway. Ah, that's not good. Wasn't expecting that. Okay, so our starter isn't functioning either. That stinks. Two electrical issues. That makes me think we should check the fuse box and look for any blown fuses. So let's go do that. And the fuse box on this car is located right behind the battery. So all we have to do is pop this off and then there's a little cover here, which we could also pop off. And now we wanna take a look at our fuses. And it's helpful if you grab the owner's manual because in the owner's manual, it has the fuse box and then what each fuse does. And since the advertisement said the fuel pump was bad on this car, before I went to go look at it, I did some research to see what causes a bad fuel pump on a 2005 Trailblazer. There is no fuel pump fuse. That's the first thing I always look for. Instead, the powertrain control module. We have one right here at fuse number 28 and one right here at fuse number 10. Both of those control the fuel pump. So let's check those fuses. And to check them, we're gonna use a multimeter and we're gonna set it to ohms. Now this is super easy. On the top of every fuse, there are two metal pieces you're gonna touch your leads to. When you do that, the numbers on the multimeter should change. If it changes, that means the fuse is good. If it stays one, that means it's bad. So keep an eye on the multimeter. If we touch this and it changes, our fuse is good. So let's test it and nothing is happening. Okay, so we found a bad fuse. Let's go check out the other fuse as well. And there we go, that fuse is good. So this PCM fuse right here is bad. So let's remove that fuse with our needle nose pliers and check it out. So this is a 20 amp fuse and it's looking a little bit melted at the top there. And check that out, you see how there's a gap in there? Those two pieces of metal should be connected and it's not. So this fuse is blown. Here's what it should look like. You see how the two pieces of metal are connected in there? This fuse is good, so let's install it. So get the blades of the fuse in the slot and push it in all the way like so. And I'm actually relieved to see a bad fuse because that means we're onto something. So with that fuse replaced, let's go start the car. All right, so let's put the key in the run position and we wanna hear a fuel pump hum behind us. Okay, that's a good sign. The fuel pump is humming. Let's see if she'll start. Come on, come on. Okay, well the starter worked, the fuel pump's going. Let's try this one more time and see what happens. Come on. All right. Yes, that is awesome. Okay, we got this. We got the car started, that's so good. Okay, real quick, you always wanna make sure there's oil pressure, and you can see we have oil pressure, so that's good. The battery's working, we are low on fuel. So we gotta, I think I'm gonna shut this off pretty quickly, but real quick, let's go outside and woohoo! Oh man, check this out. It is so loud. Oh man, that muffler's shut. Okay, I'm gonna shut this off real quick because I don't want anything to get damaged. Oh baby! Oh, and we have a check engine light too. So uh, there's a couple things wrong with this, obviously. We'll fix it up, but most importantly, we got her running. This is so exciting, yes! 
Woo! Man, that is exciting. That's super important that we got this car running. So we know there's a couple things wrong. Apparently the owner ran this out of fuel. And whenever you run something out of fuel, the fuel pump isn't lubricated, it's not cooled. And that's potentially what caused that fuse to pop. An overheated fuel pump, it's just a guess. But either way, we got it running and that is huge. Now let's see if we can move her under her own power onto the ramps. Will she go in reverse? Okay, well that works. And the brakes also work. Good, now anytime I put a car up on ramps, I put it in park, I pull the e-brake, and I always like to chalk off the wheels so there's no chance of the car rolling. So now let me show you the parts we're gonna install into this car to get it so it's safe and reliable to drive. And since we're doing this on a budget, I went to a junkyard and I got a fuel tank that has everything we need for $100. It has the fuel pump, it has all those emissions hoses for the EVAP, it even comes with that charcoal canister in the back there. All that for $100 was a great deal compared to brand new with just the fuel tank is $800. Big difference there. But we don't know the condition of that fuel pump, so I did buy a brand new OEM fuel pump, so this car is gonna run Perfect. We also have a muffler. This is a direct bolt-in muffler. It'll bolt right into the flange on the car, and then the other side we'll use a clamp. And then I also got some interior bits and pieces, so we can make this car look perfect. All right, the first thing we need to do is replace this rusted muffler, and to do that, there's a bar that runs along the bottom here. We need to remove that. It's held in by two fasteners, one on this side, one on the other side. Now, the fasteners on this car are pretty rusted, and you might be looking around and see there's a lot of surface rust. This is typical of a Northeast car. We get salt on the roads in the winter, and this is not bad, as long as it's not structural. This is all just surface rust, so it's really nothing. I know that's going to be a question you guys have. But the rust does make it difficult to remove fasteners, so a trick is to get some penetrating fluid and spray down the bolt threads with the penetrating fluid and let it soak for a minute. If you know you're going to be doing this job, you could even soak these down a few days early to make it even easier to remove the bolts. Now we could grab our ratchet and remove the bolts. And just as I figured, these are stuck on there good from all the rust. So this is where a breaker bar, which is double the length of a ratchet, will give you extra leverage to break these bolts loose. And look at how easy that made it. Now that it's broken loose, we can loosen it the rest of the way with a ratchet. And take a look at that. You can see the penetrating fluid gets into the threads, and that's what helps make it easier to loosen the bolt. So let's do the same thing on the other side. Spray down the bolt, break it free with a breaker bar, and loosen it the rest of the way with the ratchet so we could remove this cross member. So with that cross member removed, we're able to drop the exhaust out, and that's exactly what we want. Now there's two fasteners in the front at that flange over there, and then back here, you could see we have a complete welded piece. So we're gonna have to make a cut right about here. But to know exactly where to make the cut, we need our new exhaust, which is right here. Check that out. So the back, it's nice. This whole thing is just bolt in. The back has the two fasteners that we're gonna bolt up right where that flange goes. It's the same exact size. The only difference is we don't have that welded piece in the back. Instead, we have a piece that sticks out like that. So this piece sticks out a couple inches past the back of the muffler, and that's pretty much where this is right here. So I'm gonna leave a little space. I'm gonna cut right here. That way we have some room. We could always take a little bit more away, but it's a lot harder to add on. So let's cut right about there. Now one trick that helps you cut straight is to grab some tape and wrap the tape around the pipe. This gives you a straight line to follow as you cut because if you just eyeball it, you could cut at an angle by mistake. So get the saw on the line and start cutting the pipe. Beautiful! And this muffler definitely had to be replaced. So now with this end of the muffler sawed off, let's head over to the front of the muffler at the flange and we need to remove these two nuts holding it on. Now I already sprayed these down with penetrating fluid so they could soak. So grab your breaker bar and let's break them free. Well, we broke it free for sure. Good thing the new muffler has the studs on it so snapping this isn't a big deal. Let's see if the other side's gonna break loose or snap. And this side snapped too. It actually works in our favor. This makes it a lot quicker than trying to remove the nuts. So now we can remove the muffler. And to get the muffler off the exhaust hanger, a little trick is to use some silicone spray as lubricant, and then wedge a flathead screwdriver in there to help open up the hole, then pry it outwards, and it should come right out. Just like that. Since the heat shield has some holes in it, I'm gonna use a few layers of foil tape to cover up the holes and reflect that heat back down away from the cabin as a quick, simple fix. And with that patched up, let's get the new muffler in place. So let's start by sliding it into the exhaust hanger 
like that. And now it's very important that we clean up this rusty flange. So grab a metal wire brush or 180 grit sandpaper and brush around the flange where the new muffler is gonna mount to. This is gonna help the new muffler seal correctly so we don't have any exhaust leaks. So with this all cleaned up and smooth, now let's install the muffler. Get both studs aligned and then hand tighten the nuts onto the studs. And it's important that we go back and forth and tighten each nut down a little at a time so the muffler mates to the flange evenly, that way we don't get any leaks. Good. So with the two nuts tightened down, that flange is sealed. Now let's head over to the rear of the muffler and install the rest of the exhaust onto the end of the muffler. And this will slide right in there. Perfect. Now I'm going to use one of these U-bolt exhaust clamps and this fits perfectly around the end of our stock exhaust pipe. And this is going to create a nice tight seal. Now when you tighten these nuts down, do the same thing as before and tighten one down a little, then tighten the other down a little, go back and forth so that you have an even clamping force which is going to seal the muffler completely. And the last thing to do is to install a new rubber exhaust hanger insulator, but as you can see this one is slightly off. So let's hit the hanger with the hammer and bend it back so we could get this on. And now with a little bit of wiggling, the rubber insulator could fit into place like it should. All right, with everything in place, now we're going to go start the car up and we're going to grab our soapy water and spray down all of the areas that we connected the exhaust to make sure there's no exhaust leaks. All soapy water is, is dish soap and water. It's going to create bubbles if there's an exhaust leak. So let's start her up. And with the engine running, spray down the connection with soapy water. And I don't see any bubbles at all over here, so this looks good. So now let's move to the front and spray down this connection as well. Beautiful, and I don't see any bubbles coming out of here, so our exhaust is sealed. All right, with our exhaust installed perfectly, it's nice and quiet, there's no exhaust leaks. Next thing to do is to drop the old tank and install the new tank. But before we drop the old tank, it's a good idea. Let's take a look at the new tank to see all the connectors we need to remove so we can successfully remove and replace this tank. Okay, looking at our new fuel tank, we'll start at the rear. We're gonna have to disconnect our fuel filler hose and then going to the front of the tank, we have two fuel lines, we'll have to disconnect these and then there's a strap here and a strap here holding the tank up. We'll remove those straps and slowly lower the tank about halfway. Not all the way because we don't want to yank this wiring harness out. So then we'll undo the wires for the wiring harness. Then we can lower it the rest of the way. And that's all there is to it. Now before we do any of this, it's very important to remove the fuel pressure from the fuel lines so the fuel isn't squirting all over the place. And to do that, it's very easy. We come over here to the fuse box. If you have a fuel pump fuse, you're going to pull that. In this case, we have a fuel pump relay. So we're going to pull that out. And then all we need to do is crank the engine over a couple of times. And that will dissipate all the fuel pressure because the fuel injectors are firing, but the fuel pump is off. So now we have no fuel pressure. And finally, it's a good idea to disconnect the negative terminal on your battery anytime you're working with the fuel system. That'll prevent sparks and fuel and sparks definitely don't mix. And one last safety tip is to always have a class B fire extinguisher when working with gasoline, dropping the fuel tank, changing the fuel pump, anything like that. We have a class B and C fire extinguisher. B is good for flammable liquids and C is good for electrical fires. So we are well protected here. Now we could begin dropping the fuel tank. Okay, so let's start at the rear of the fuel tank right in front of the rear axle where the fuel filler hose is. First, loosen the hose clamp with a screwdriver and slide the clamp up out of the way. Then pull the hose off the tank like that Next, at the front of the tank, let's remove the two fuel lines. And at the top of the connection is a button you press down. So press that button, and as you do that, pull the line out and remove it, just like that. Good. Now with the other connector, you can see the button on the bottom, press that in, and pull the line out. And sometimes these are difficult to remove, so you could use a screwdriver to pry the connector like so and that'll free it enough so you could disconnect it. And I should mention, there's probably gonna be some residual fuel in the lines, so have a towel or a catch can ready just in case. So with the fuel lines disconnected, now we're able to drop the tank. But before we drop it, this thing could be heavy, so we need to support the tank. So slide a jack under and raise the jack so it lightly touches the bottom of the tank. And with the tank supported, now we can remove the straps that hold it in by removing the bolts. So let's break it free with a breaker bar and then loosen it the rest of the way with a ratchet. And with the first strap free, let's head to the back of the tank and remove the second strap right here. So break it free with the breaker bar and then again loosen it the rest of the way with a ratchet. Good. Now let's carefully lower the tank down about halfway, which will give us access to the fuel pump wiring. 
So pop the wire off the pressure sensor and then pop the wire off the fuel pump, like so. Finally, let's drop the tank down the rest of the way and slide it out from under the vehicle. Now the last thing we need to do is remove the old rusty charcoal canister and this is held in by three bolts. So let's remove those and the canister comes right out. So out with the old and in with the new. Well, almost new. And check this out, no wonder this car had no fuel in it. It wasn't a busted fuel pump, it was a melted fuel tank. And he couldn't fill it up because of this fuel filler neck. It's just melted solid, look at that. No wonder, check it out, this is what it's supposed to look like. Fuel could easily get in there. And this is what happened, this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. I'm guessing that bad exhaust caused all that hot exhaust gas to get all over this and just melted the evap lines, the vent tube, all this stuff here. So this tank wasn't working properly. And he's lucky he didn't have an explosion or a fire. So we're done with this one. Now we're on to this one right here. And all we need to do is remove this old fuel pump and we'll put the new fuel pump in and then we'll get our tank installed. Now this is gonna be the most difficult part because all of this is so rusted and getting these hoses off without breaking them is gonna be a pain. But don't worry, I have a really good trick at removing these connectors without breaking the brittle plastic. So let me show you, let's replace this fuel pump. Now it's very important, before you remove the fuel pump, you want to remove all the dirt and rust sitting on top of the tank so it doesn't fall into the tank by mistake when you remove the fuel pump. So I'm going to clean off the top of the tank and make sure that doesn't happen and contaminate the fuel system. And after this is all clean, we could remove these two connectors from the fuel pump. Now it's super important we do not damage these. They're very hard to find replacements for, and they're made of plastic which is brittle. So I'm gonna show you some tricks so that we get these off successfully. And you can see how rusted everything is, so gotta be very careful here. The first thing to do is spray down the connections with penetrating fluid to help break apart the rust. Next, grab a flathead screwdriver and press the button in on the connector, and at the same time, twist the connector and pull it upwards until the connector comes off like that. Good. Now with the other connector, do the same thing. Press the button in with the screwdriver. Oh man, that's what I was afraid of. This thing isn't budging. It's all rust welded in there. I'm sure that rust expanded and it's making it impossible to get this out. So the trick here is to grab a locking pliers and clamp it onto the metal tube about one screwdriver length away from the connector. Now what you're gonna do is get a pair of flathead screwdrivers between the pliers and the connector and pry at the connector back and forth to loosen up that connection. Then press the button down and use a screwdriver to pry off the connector. And then we could pop it off the rest of the way like that. And now this fuel pump is being held in with one of these locking rings. So to remove it, we just need to turn it, but as usual, it's all rusted, so it's not gonna be easy. So cover the whole ring with penetrating fluid, and don't be afraid, you could use as much as you want of this stuff. Then get a flathead screwdriver and a hammer, and work your way around the locking ring, hitting it counterclockwise to remove it. This might take a few tries, as it's on there pretty good with all that rust. Eventually, with all the rust loosened up, just a few more hits, and there we go. The lock ring can be removed. Now that we made a mess, let's clean up the rust so it doesn't fall in the tank. And finally, we could pull the fuel pump up and out of the fuel tank. Now, odds are you got some rust in the tank, so grab a paper towel and make sure you remove all of it. Any rust or dirt could cause the new fuel pump to clog up and fail. So inspect the tank and make sure it's spotless like this. Beautiful. Now I always like to match up both of my parts, the old part and the new part, to make sure they're identical, and these are. So let's install the new one. We'll start by installing the O-ring, which goes right in this little channel here. Then we could get the new fuel pump in place, being careful not to damage the float. And then the rest of the pump goes straight in, making sure nothing gets hung up, just like that. Then make sure it's facing the correct direction, and now we could get the new lock ring over the fuel pump and push it down into place. With this, we wanna hammer it clockwise until the ring turns all the way to lock down the new fuel pump. And with the ring bottomed out and turned all the way, the pump is locked in place. Finally, let's connect our fuel lines and they just press on until you hear a click. And always try to pull the connector off to make sure it's secure. All right, now check out this tank. This looks brand new, all cleaned up. We got the new fuel pump in there and we are ready to install it in the Trailblazer and let's see if this thing actually runs and drives. So let's jack the tank up about halfway. That way we could connect our wiring harness to the fuel pump, good, and that click means it's in. And do the same for the pressure sensor, good. And now we could carefully jack it up the rest of the way so that we could strap it in. Now I like to use a little bit of medium strength thread locker on these bolts so they don't back out due to vibration. Then get it in there with the strap and hand tighten it. And I'm gonna be using a digital torque wrench to torque these to spec. 
So they're supposed to be torqued down to 24 foot-pounds, so set the wrench to that. Good, and as we tighten this down, a rapid beep means we're close, and a solid beep means we met the specified torque. Perfect. Same thing for the rear strap. Hand tighten the bolt in place, and torque it down to spec. Now, in every video I make, I always get comments asking how do I find the correct torque spec for each bolt? Because it varies from car to car and bolt to bolt. So where I get my torque specs? Well, multiple places. One, I search online, and two, I use repair manuals like this. And at the beginning of each chapter, you can see we have the fuel and exhaust systems chapter. It'll tell you the torque for whatever fastener you're looking for. For example, the fuel tank mounting strap bolts, the ones that we just tightened, 24 foot-pounds, is right there. So this is super helpful in figuring out what the correct torque spec is for the fasteners on your vehicle. All right, so now let's lower and remove the jack from under the tank, and let's go to the front of the tank and attach those fuel lines. The only trick to this is you want to push the connector until you hear a click. That click lets you know it's secured, so do the same with the other fuel line. Good, and now they're both securely connected. Next, at the back of the tank, let's install the hose onto the fuel tank. So wiggle it onto the tank until it can't go any further down, and then tighten the hose clamp so it's snug and the hose won't come off. And with that done, let's bolt up the new charcoal canister, so out with the old melted one, and in with the new junkyard one. Next, we could torque down the three bolts that hold it in, and now let's connect the three evap hoses to the charcoal canister. And it's nice because each one's a different size, so you can't mix them up. Then on top of the fuel tank, connect the wiring that goes to the purge solenoid and connect the vent tube to the tank. And finally, we need to connect all three evap hoses to the tank like so. All right, and with everything connected, our fuel tank is completely installed. Now there's one more thing we need to do, and that is install this cross member. So let's finish this job up. So align the cross member, hand tighten the bolt in, and then torque it down. And the same for the other side. Hand tighten the bolt, and then torque it down. And finally, put the fuel pump relay back in, reconnect the negative terminal onto the battery, and then cover the fuse box. And that leaves us with one last thing we need to do, and that is fill up the gas tank so we could try to start her up. So let's do that now. We want to fill this to at least a quarter of a tank so there's enough fuel for the fuel pump to prime properly. And as we add fuel, it's a good idea to look for leaks. And the most likely place we're going to get leaks is right here where our hose connects to the gas tank. And in this case, I don't see any leaks, so that's good. So about five gallons later, let's tighten the gas cap and we are good to go. All right, moment of truth. What we've all been waiting for, starting this car up. Now, since we just put a new fuel pump in and there's new fuel in there, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the key to the run position. The fuel pump is priming right now. It just stopped priming. We're gonna do it again. And this is gonna pressurize those fuel lines. It's gonna push all the air out and push all the new fuel in. Also, it's a good idea. Go under the car where you attached your fuel lines and make sure, since it's now pressurized, there are no leaks. And this is leak free. So with those fuel lines pressurized, let's start her up. Man, she started right up. That misfire is completely gone. This engine feels buttery smooth. That idle's good. We have good oil pressure. The alternator is charging. This looks good. No check engine lights. Woo, baby. And this sounds so, so good. Let's go for a ride and see how she drives. All right, so we've been driving around for about 20 minutes now. We filled her up with gas. The tank is full. The operating temperature is consistent. She's not overheating. That misfire we had in the beginning is completely gone with the new tank, so that's fixed. The engine is super smooth. The transmission shifts nicely. I mean, everything, the, the car's tracking straight, which is great. There's no clunks in the suspension. Everything is working. This is just, this is great. What do you think, Coop? <laughs> I can't agree more. All right, let's finish up this test drive and head home. Okay, so we did it. We fixed this $500 car for less than $1,000 total, including the purchase price of this car. How awesome is that? We spent $70 to replace this old muffler and install a brand new one. We spent $100 to replace this old melted fuel tank with a junkyard version that works perfect. And for reliability, we spent $230 replacing this old fuel pump with a brand new OEM one. So together, we spent $400 
$400 plus $500 for the car, so $900 in total. And this car right now, as it sits, is worth about $3,000. So a $2,100 profit. And the best part is, my favorite part, we brought a car back from the dead. This car was destined for the scrapper, and we fixed it at home ourselves using common hand tools. A 150-piece socket set, a saw, a hammer, screwdrivers, pliers. That is all it takes to fix something like this. You could do this at home. But wait, there's more. Although this car runs and drives great, it's incredibly dirty inside and out. Look at how dirty these carpets are. So this interior needs a real good cleaning. Also, the door trim needs to be installed on both sides and we need to fix our center console, which doesn't latch. And finally, the outside of the car is a mess. The paintwork needs some paint correction because, I mean, look at this. It's oxidized and dull and faded because of the sun. So in the next video, I'm going to show you how to detail this car and do a full paint correction by hand. We're going to go from this to this and this to this. So there's going to be a lot of tips and tricks in that video, so stay tuned. But there you go, for now, you just learned how to buy yourself an affordable project car and fix it up at home on a budget using common hand tools. How great is this? I love it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video and learned a lot. If you did, remember to give the video a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider hitting that subscribe button for more videos just like this and for the next video on cleaning this car up. And as always, all the tools and products I used in this video are linked in the description. Stay tuned.